Jaz pa imam to priložnost, da nas pozovam oziroma, da nam predstavim še našega naslednjega govorca. In zdaj ta trenutek, ko bomo počasi preskočili na drugi jezik in sicer v angliščino, še preden pa preskočimo v angliščino, bi pa rada našega gosta predstavila še v slovenščini in sicer z nami je mednarodni priznan slavnostni govornik Ryan Jenkins. On je med drugim tudi virtualni trener, avtor številnih knjig in pa člankov na temo voditeljstva, medgeneracijskih razlik in pa prihodnosti dela. Je tudi vsa ustanovitelj podjetja Sync Learning Experience, ki se prvenceno ukvarja z posamičnimi delavnicami razvoja vodi, je pa tudi predsednik platforme Top Rock digitalne univerze, kjer lahko študenti pridobijo univerzitetno izobrazbo s šolanjem preko pametnega telefona. Če povzamem, Ryan Jenkins je strkovnjak na področju dela in vodanja skozi različne generacije in veliko nam zna povedati o prihodnosti dela ter zmanjševanje osamljenosti in krepitve pripadnosti pri delu. Ok, Ryan, hi! Hello. Hello, how are you? Doing great, how are you? We are super excited to have you here with us. So um, I've, I've just introduced you in, in Slovene language. Um, hope, hopefully that's okay, I can repeat everything in English, but if anyone uh, knows a lot about you, I think it's, it's you. Um, most, of, uh, most important thing that I said that you are really an expert in, in this topic, how to uh, enhance collaboration, uh, how to make sure that different generations can uh, collaborate together, uh, uh, the future of work. Uh, so we're really excited to hear uh, more about how to lead and work across generations in order to foster this creativity and innovation. And we're really excited that it's you who is here with us. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Dobrodan, everyone. Uh, my name Dobrodan. is Ryan Jenkins. Oh, wow. <laughs> You speak Slovenian. That's it. That's it. That's all I know. So that's um, <laughs> okay. Great. Uh, if you're ever interested, we're willing to teach you another word uh, that is really commonly used. It's it's hvala. So this one you can use after your your speech. It it means thank you. Hvala. It's like time. koala. Koala. <laughs> hvala. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. So. We did the learning part. Um, I'm going to put myself to mute now, uh, Ryan, and I'm going to give the words to you. Uh, here we go. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time and attention. Really looking forward to our time together today. And yeah, today we're talking about how to lead and work across generations with a specific lens on why this is important to foster creativity and innovation. So let's get started. Um, I'd like to ask you a rhetorical question, and that is, do you ever experience cross-generational friction? And if we we're all in the same room, we'd have everyone's hand raised, right? Because we all experience this, and you are not alone. In fact, just look at these staggering statistics that are going to help frame our conversation today. And that is 75% of managers report that managing a multi-generational team is a challenge. Secondly, 77% of workers identify different work expectations across generations as a challenge. And lastly, 72% of workers identify a lack of comfort with younger employees managing older employees. So no matter how you slice this generational conversation, there's tension, there's friction. So if you find yourself um, having a hard time navigating and working and leading across generations, you are not alone, my friends. And today, the goal is to help give you some strategies and some context to help you lessen that friction. So here's the overview and payoff of our short time together today. And today's global workforce is more generationally diverse than ever before. And it's resulting in clashing work styles, communication preferences, and leadership expectations. And today you're gonna to discover why this is happening. And then I'm gonna give you some simple yet very mighty solutions to effectively communicate and work across generations. So that's the overview and the payoff of our time together. And here's how we're gonna divide our time uh, over the next 60 minutes. First, we're gonna talk about generations, give you an overview why the generational gap exists. Then I'm gonna give you those strategies I've been alluding to. 
And then we should have some time for some Q&A at the end. So be thinking about your questions and I'll do my best to address all of those at the end. And then we're gonna be doing a competition at the end of our time together that'll serve as a recap of everything that we're about to learn. Um, and the winner will be able to receive a copy of my latest book, which is all about Generation Z. Um, so stay tuned for that. And lastly, there's my email. So if you have any questions three hours from now, three years from now, uh, send me an email. I'm here to help. I want to add as much value as I can outside uh, of these 60 minutes I have with you. So don't hesitate to keep in touch. All right, my friends, we're going to do some live polling today. So here's how it's going to work. Pull out a, an internet connected device. I would recommend your phone, but you can open up a new browser on your desktop if you'd prefer and visit this link, pollev.com slash live poll. So I'll give you a couple seconds to get there now, pollev.com slash live poll. I'm gonna put it in ch chat as well. Oh, already got it in chat there. Thank you, thank you. Now, once you arrive there, you don't have to put in any information. You just go to that link and here's how it's gonna work. When I prompt the polling slide, you will simply see uh, the question, the potential responses, and you tap or click whatever response you believe to be correct, and we'll see your results live on the screen. So here's my first question. Where are you today? So this is a clickable map, so you can actually um, pinch in to, to put a pin on where you're joining us today. I'm going to be playing along as well, and I, as I mentioned, am across the pond in Atlanta, Georgia. Pretty happy with that pin. <laughs> it's hard I to like to Virginia, by the way. We're, we're a tiny, tiny country. I know, it's going to be hard to <laughs> do your best to get where, where it is. And I figure that's where everyone was going to be. But I asked this question because, um, you know, I've been doing a lot of these virtual sessions lately for obvious reasons. And it's always a good reminder that, you know, no matter how far apart we are, because we're not in the same room today, um, Thankfully, we have technology that's able to bring us together and we are present in this moment together. Um, so I like to, to, to get us warmed up with this question, but here's um, some interesting data that, that um, I'd like to know for this group is what is your generation? Of course, we're gonna be talking about generation. So it's always helpful to have a, a benchmark of, of the generations represented in our virtual room today. And I am of the millennial generation, so I'll be playing along here as well. So it looks like most of the room today is millennials. We got some Gen Xers, but no oh, a baby boomer or two. That's fantastic. Um, it's always nice to have a more diverse uh, group. So I always love if we, even Gen Zers are in the room because then we've got the four major generations that are in the workforce. Um, but this is helpful to, to kind of tee up our, our conversation today. So here are the generations. The middle column is done by age as of this year. The right side, that's the global population. So it gives you a sense of how the generations stack up around the world. But anytime you and I are talking about generations today and moving forward into the future, it's really critical that we note this. Are you ready? Generations are clues they're not absolutes. Generations are clues, they're not absolutes. But in my opinion, and I think you're gonna agree with me after our time together, they're very big clues on how you lead, communicate, recruit, sell, fill in the blank. The better understanding you and I have of each generation, the better equipped we are to thrive in today's multi-generational marketplace. But keep in mind, Anytime you find yourself in a conversation around generations today and moving forward in the future, remember, they're clues, not absolutes. Here is how the generations shake out in the global workforce. As of 2021, these are the numbers. 2016 was the first year that millennials became the dominant generation in the global workforce, which is one of many reasons why they're so highly talked about. Um, but now you notice Generation Z is just now inching into the workforce, and they're going to be flooding the workforce at a pace we really haven't seen before. So by 2030, this will be the makeup of the global workforce. Three out of four workers around the world will be of the emerging generations. 
So one of the reasons I love talking about generations is I believe that the emerging generations give us data points into what's next. So if we understand these emerging generations, they give us insights on what to expect in the future. So in our case, we, get a, we start to get unpack and start to get a glimpse into what the 2030 workplace will look like. Um, and as we can imagine, with three out of four workers being digital natives that fundamentally approach communication and approach work differently than previous generations, the 2030 workplace and workforce will be much different than what we're even experiencing today. So one of the, one of the uh, great things about generations is that, again, they give us data points into what's next. And so that's kind of an undercurrent to our conversation today. Here's another example as to why you and I are experiencing more generational friction than ever before. Uh, and it's depicted wonderfully in this clip. So take a look. Kind of like grandkids equals free tech support. Oh, 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 Lord. Yes. oh look at you. So great to see you. None of this works. Come on in. <laughs> Many I'm sure can relate. Um, and what you just saw here is pretty, it's a seismic shift because we've never really seen anything like this before. And what we see here is that we have an emerging generation that now has skills and knowledge that previous generations don't have. That's the first time we've really ever encountered this as a, as a species, right? Um, usually knowledge is passed on generation by generation, but now with the influx of technology, um, we have an emerging generation that, again, has skills and knowledge that previous generations don't have. And you see it depicted here, where Generation Z, they grew up as the chief technology officers of their household, right? They were helping mom and dad or grandma, grandpa troubleshoot a laptop, what TikTok was, how to use a, a smartphone, et cetera. And now this is finding its way into the workplace. And so you might find yourself uh, interacting with um, folks of a different generation that have don't have the knowledge and skills that you do. And again, that represents some friction as it relates to working across generations. All right, let's do another poll question. And you don't have to hit the refresh button. You shouldn't even have to hit the back button. You should now see this poll on your device. And I'm curious, what do you think goes in the blank? 52% of workers say they're least likely to belong with someone from another blank. And if you're just now joining us, if you visit the, the link at the top of the slide there, um, that's all you need to actually interact live with today's session. And if you're watching a recorded version of this, unfortunately, um, you won't be able to interact live, but hopefully these data points and the responses from your peers will be insightful nonetheless. Of course, planet here is the tongue in cheek response, but boy, as we keep sending people up in space, um, that might be a viable answer a lot sooner than any of us can imagine. So most are saying country or culture. Now this is the only time I'm gonna do this to this, this fine bunch of individuals and the correct answer I did not give to you. The correct answer, of course, I'm looking for is generations or age. And the reason I intentionally removed that, uh, the correct answer, was to make a very poignant point in your mind that actually generation trumps all of these other diversity metrics as causing the most tension in the workforce. So yes, 52% of workers say they're least likely to get along with someone from another generation. And unfortunately, this is a trend that is not slowing down because 62% of Gen Z anticipate challenges working with baby boomers and Gen X yet only 5% anticipate challenges working with millennials. So the data is very clear that there is a gap between the emerging generations and the established generations. And if we're first not aware that that gap exists, and then if we're not equipped with strategies to close that gap, you and I are gonna find ourselves more and more disconnected from the folks that we're leading, from the folks that we're working alongside, from the customers and clients that we serve, from people in our communities, so the goal today is to understand why this gap exists and then give you some strategies to close that gap. Um, one of the things that I think is really important to discuss as it relates to generational bias is um, just to give you a little food for thought as to how we overcome our generational bias. Because whether we like it or not, we all have one. For most of us, that generational bias is, is unconscious, but it's subtly influencing our decisions. 
And so we actually have to push against our own human nature to remain more open-minded. And so I often encourage my audiences to just be more curious and less certain, right? We got to lean into the curiosity, especially as so many things are changing these days. Um, we've got to lean more into curiosity and less into certainty. And to give you um, some more context on why this is so important and why diversity spurs innovation and why this multi-generational conversation is so important as it relates to creativity and innovation is for the following reasons. Generational diversity creates diversity of thought or what else is what also called cognitive diversity. And cognitive diversity actually creates a wellspring of creativity. And it enhances innovation by 20% and it reduces risk by 30%. So all that to say, like-minded teams maintain, but it's the diverse teams that innovate. And having a multi-generational team is a massive value because if you um, can get a multi-generational team around a table attacking the same problem, you get multiple um, viewpoints and perspectives and experiences that can weigh in, that can tackle that problem. And thus it's gonna help enhance innovation, reduce um, risk as noted here. Um, and so this is why this generational conversation is so critical as it relates to innovation and creativity. So let's talk briefly about generational needs and how they are more similar than they are different. So human needs, regardless of age, have remained relatively unchanged for centuries. Um, I like using this model by my friend, Britt Andrietta. Uh, she studies the brain and specifically she likes to um, study the brain and how it shows up at work, which I think is so uh, needed. And it's, uh, she's done some tremendous work. But she's essentially boiled down Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you ever uh, remember studying Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you identify that humans have six core needs. And Britt reduces it um, to, to uh, even further, which I love, and I think it's a little bit more memorable. But Britt says, at the end of the day, humans, we, our core need is to survive, right? Do I have food, water, shelter? That is the question that we are asking ourselves. Once we satisfy that need, we can move up to the next tier, which is belong. We're asking ourselves, am I contributing? Um, am I valued amongst my tribe? And then once we satisfy that one, our final need is to become. At that point, we're asking ourselves, am I living my full potential? So again, regardless of age, human needs have remained relatively unchanged for centuries. But, this is the big but that our conversation hinges on today, how humans fill these needs is changing rapidly and it varies across generations. So I'm gonna give you three examples in the next slide, um, but I wanna further kind of hammer home this point that yes, these are the three core human needs. And at the end of the day, we all have these, no matter your age, no matter where you live on the planet, these are our three core human needs. But um, unlike our, our ancestors that roamed the plains thousands of years ago, they were kind of stuck in that bottom tier, weren't they? They were constantly trying to figure out where their next meal was, um, you know, where's shelter and what's that rustling in that bush, right? They were just stuck in that survive stage. But you and I have the luxury of, of working up this model, right? We're playing in the belong stage. We're playing in the become stage in our, in our careers. And so, yeah, we're seeing this upward trajectory happening. And with this upward trajectory, it's changing how we work, right? It's, it's shifting workers' expectations. It's even redefining the employer-employee relationship. I imagine you're having conversations today that you did, thought you would never have in the workplace just five years ago. And that's because we have an emerging generation that's, that's in the belong stage or they're looking to their employers to help them reach the become stage and uh, fulfill their, their full potential. And so this is natural for us to kind of go up this, this, this upward trajectory, but this is what's causing um, some other conversations to be had at work. So let me give you a couple examples of how, again, how the generational need is the same, but it varies about how we go about fulfilling it. So here are the four major generations in the workforce. And let's take communication. That's a core need we all have. For boomers, they need background info and details. Gen X want to keep it professional. Millennials efficient, mobile first. Gen Z, it's mobile only, video and voice command. Uh, training is a, is a need that we all have to constantly sharpen our skills. For boomers, they define it as on the job and classroom. Gen X, it's e-learning. Millennials, micro and on demand. Gen Z, it's mobile, just-in-time, virtual reality, augmented reality. 
and feedback. Uh, that's one we're going to dig into in just a little bit, but it defines across, it's, it varies across the generations. Boomers know news is good news. Gen X wants semi-annual reviews, millennials routine check-ins, Gen Z want 360 degree real-time feedback. None of these are wrong, they're just different. And if we wanna be effective uh, at working across generations, we've gotta be aware of these, these nuances in order to connect and influence properly across generations. Um, so a question I get often asked is, well, right, how do I stay relevant in a, prone that, a world that's prone to disruption? How do we stay relevant? Of course, the theme that we're talking about today is innovation and creativity. So how do we stay relevant? Um, well, first, I need us all to understand that right now, someone somewhere is messing with the prevailing model of your industry. I don't care what industry you're in, it, it's, it's getting shaken up, right? Of course, even pre the pandemic, uh, this was occurring, right? Because of how fast innovation and technology is moving, it's challenging the prevailing models of all the things that, that we once, um, you know, how we live our lives and how we work, et cetera. Um, and the problem with prevailing models is, is we can't see them, right? We, if you're in it, you don't understand that it's holding you back. And prevailing models, are, are, that's what causes leaders to get stuck. It's what causes organizations uh, to get stuck. It's what causes companies and industries, entire industries to go under, right? Is they're, they're stuck uh, on the, the prevailing model. So what we need to do is we need to seek uniquely better. What makes our services, what makes our uh, us as individuals uniquely better um, than our competitors. And to find that it's really difficult and it can't happen in a vacuum. You actually have to step outside of the prevailing model and look in to try to figure out what makes the organization uh, uniquely better. And so ultimately we have to listen to outsiders. More than ever, we've got to listen to folks that are outside of, of what we normally know. And so that's people that are outside our organization, outside the industry. That's why events like these are so tremendous because we get to hear from different people that have different experiences. And then specifically for our conversation today, we need to listen to folks that are outside of our generation because we all bring unique viewpoints and perspectives to the table. And so now more than ever, as, we, as the world's gonna continue to be a turbulent and in high flux, we've got to listen to outsiders and figure out how we can continuously um, be aware of the prevailing model that might be holding us back. All right, my friends, uh, that wraps up the first part. We're gonna jump into some strategies, uh, but quick reminder, we're gonna be doing a competition towards the end of our time together and hopefully have some time for some Q&A as well. And don't forget to email me if I can help you out in any other way, but let's jump into the strategies. And I'd love for you to answer this first question. 74% of Gen Z believe jobs should have blank. What do you think it is? And again, uh, if you visit that link at the top of the slide there, that's all you need to interact live. So the correct answer here is greater meaning. They want greater meaning. So that's going to uh, lead us into this first strategy that I'm going to share with you. And I'm going to share four examples. And I want you to think to yourself what these four things have in common. So the first one is scholarship fundraisers felt more motivated to secure donations when they had contact with scholarship recipients. Lifeguards were more vigilant after reading stories about people whose lives have been saved by lifeguards. Number three, cooks were more motivated and worked harder when they saw those who would be eating their food. And lastly, radiologists were more accurate reading x-rays when showing a picture of the patient. So what do these four items have in common? I'm sure many of you can see the, the common thread here. So here's what these four items have in common. Workers connected to the people benefiting from their labor. So when that happens, it improves performance. And this has been tested across all various industries. And you see just four represented here, uh, but it's pretty compelling. And so what are we to do from all this? Well, here is the first cross-generational strategy I'd like to share with you. And that is identify the beneficiaries of the labor. So connecting workers to the beneficiaries of the work creates more engagement, motivation, and allows employees to transcend their task lists. 
And this is especially going to be helpful as more and more Gen Z enter the workforce, because as we saw, uh, over 70% of them want more meaning at work. And so one way to infuse more meaning at work is to identify the work that we do and the specific people that are benefiting from that work and draw a very straight and clear line between those two. So let me give you an example of how you go about doing this. And you simply ask why repeatedly. Research tells, tells us we gotta ask why five times to get to the crux of, uh, uh, of who's benefiting from our labor. So let me give you an example. If we were to talk to a group that cleans hotel rooms, um, here's what it would look like. We'd say, hey, why do you clean hotel rooms? And they would give you the surface level response of, because that's what my boss tells me to do. <laughs> Um, so we got to dig a little bit more and then we say, well, why does that matter? Uh, because it keeps the rooms from getting dirty. And why does that matter? Well, it's because it makes the rooms more sanitary and more pleasant. And why does that matter? It's because it provides a clean space for customers to relax and rejuvenate. If we ask why enough, we can begin to identify who's benefiting from our labor. And it's not always folks outside the organization. Sometimes there's folks inside the organization um, that are benefiting from a specific task or process that we have to do. So again, the clearer that we can be about who those people are, um, it can bring much more motivation, engagement, much more meaning to the work that we do every day. All right, let's move to our second strategy. And I'd like you to answer this question. The emerging generations want blank 50% more often than other employees. What do you think it is? So most of you are saying feedback followed by recognition. There's a case to be made, I think, for most of these, but the correct answer I'm looking for here is feedback. So most of you, over half of you, uh, chose that. So let's unpack that. Um, and I first want to convince you that quality feedback elevates performance. There was a recent study done here in the United States where they took a group of seventh graders and they divided this group into, well, I'm sorry, it was one big group and they gave the task the same, they gave the group a task that was the same, you know, across for everybody. And the task was to write an essay. So they all had the same task. All these seventh graders wrote an essay. They turned those in and then the teachers randomly divided those, um, those essays into two separate groups. So there was group A and there was group B. And in group A, they gave this feedback on all those essays. They said, I'm giving you these comments so that you'll have feedback on your paper. When they gave those comments, it resulted in 40% of students revising and resubmitting their papers. So not a, not a terrible outcome, but of course, lots of room for improvement. For group B, they gave this feedback. They said, I'm giving you these comments because I have very high expectations and I know you can reach them. When the teachers gave that feedback, it resulted in 80% of students revising and resubmitting their papers, and they made twice as many corrections as group A. So just a, some additional feedback resulted in doubled performance. So what happened? Let's break it down. They simply added high standards, and they injected assurance in their feedback, and that's what resulted in the doubling of the performance. So we have to be strategic about our feedback. And again, feedback is something that we, we all need, if we, especially if we wanna grow in our, in our uh, careers and in our lives. Um, but specifically the emerging generations have a much bigger appetite when it comes to feedback. We can talk about why that might be in the Q and A if anyone's curious. Um, but this is a tool that will work universally around across generations. But I think specifically for the emerging generations who are wanting more of it, this tool will help you to deliver on that increased appetite for more feedback. So of course we wanna give high standards and assurance as we saw in that last example, but a lot of the folks that, that we're leading or we're giving feedback to are a little bit more complicated than a seventh grader. So we have to boost this uh, formula up just a bit and we need to add direction and support. So here's what uh, effective feedback that works across generation might sound like. So it might sound like I have high expectations for you. I know you can reach them. So try this new challenge, you know, insert whatever that task or challenge or objective might be, 
And if you fail, I'll help you recover. That last part's really important, specifically for the emerging generations. Um, but this is what it looks like. So I wanna encourage you to try the feedback formula at some point. And again, here it is. And I'd love for you to use this formula because it really does inspire belief. It'll transform work ethic and it instills confidence among a team. And we're all in need of more feedback and helpful, clear feedback, I guess I should add. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if as more and more Gen Zers uh, enter into your organizations and on your teams, um, that they're going to be craving more feedback. And this is a formula to help deliver more clear and consistent feedback. All right, here's our last polling question um, before our competition. But I've got one more strategy to share with you. Um, and this question tees it up. I want to I want to know what you think the number one leadership style uh, is for, for, for connecting and influencing across generations. All right, most of you are saying coaching, and that is the correct answer, is coaching. So well done. Let's uh, talk about coaching. Um, and before I do that, I guess I'd like to share why there's a shift in authority that has occurred. So in the past, you and I, this, um, how did we info gather in the past? Well, there was one central source, right? Information was centralized in the past, right? We had to go to one institution or one book or uh, one individual to gain certain information. But now today and moving forward in the future, information is now decentralized, right? We can, we can learn pretty much anything we want in the palm of our hands. So information is now decentralized. Well, whether you know it or not, that changes how we must lead in the future. So the leadership approach that worked really effectively in the past was kind of this top down. Well, that was, that was helpful when one person had all the information and information was centralized. Well, now information is decentralized. So a network approach to leadership is really gonna be more effective in the future. Um, and we're seeing this more and more as emerging generations, they're not necessarily looking up the, up the hierarchy inside an organization for all the answers. They're looking out into the world. They're looking for subject matter experts that can help them solve uh, specific problems. So this makes coaching the number one leadership style that resonates with the emerging generations because coaching isn't a top-down approach. Coaching is a side-to-side -side approach, right? You're coming alongside somebody and you're, you're coaching them. We, I've, it's my understanding there's been a lot of talk around mentoring um, for, during this event, which is fantastic. And I hope this kind of supplements those conversations as well. Um, but I would love for you to consider to be a guide on the side. Rather than not be a, a sage on the stage, right? Where there's one, it's one way information. I want you to be a guide on the side that's, that you're coaching each generation through their learnings, their failures, their successes, right? We're, we're guiding them. We're not necessarily, um, uh, you know, the sage on the stage, one way information. So here's a, an effective way to think about coaching. Coaching is really simple to do, but it's hard to execute. So here it is. This is all the essence of coaching. Coaching is all about resisting advice giving and asking more questions. That's it. <laughs> now, that can be really hard to do, right? If you're in a coaching session and you're leading somebody and you often want to give your experience or give your advice because you can see that they're on a train that's about to go off a cliff, you can see that cliff coming. They can't. But if we just give them the information, that's not helpful for the individual. That doesn't make them ultimately an independent um, and productive worker. So instead, we need to ask the right questions to get them thinking about what the potential response or answer might be. And it's hard to hold your tongue. It's hard to ask the right questions. But I'm going to give you five questions to consider in a coaching session. And the first would be, what's on your mind? That's ultimately just a smokescreen because you want to kind of get the clutter out of their off their brain. And the next question is really what's important and what else? That what else is oftentimes what you'll, you'll, uh, you'll start to pull out the real uh, uh, kind of pain point or really what's on their mind. And this is a good clarifying question. What's the real challenge here for you? Help them to understand what is really the, the core challenge that I'm wrestling with. And then you want to ask them, how can you help? You know, what is it that I, as a coach or a leader can do? 
And then this last question, what was most useful or valuable here for you? This is a good question to plant the seed in their mind that, hey, this was a valuable exchange of information. I should pursue this relationship or this type of engagement the next time I encounter a problem. So it leaves the door open for more healthy coaching and dialogue in the future. All right, my friends, uh, we talked about the generations. Hopefully I gave you uh, some good context there. And I gave you three strategies that we can all enact tomorrow if we'd like. Now I'd like to jump into some Q&A, but first we're gonna do this competition to see um, who can win this book. Here's how it's gonna work. You visit the link we've been using this whole time. So if you haven't been polling with us, it's not too late, visit that link and you can chime in as well. You wanna answer correctly as fast as you can. That's the whole point, it's just answer correctly. And the faster you answer correctly, the more points you're gonna get. And lastly, I'm sorry, you know, uh, again, as I mentioned, the winner will receive a copy of my book. And when we start, you're going to be randomly assigned a guest ID, and that's just how you'll be tracked on the leaderboard. Uh, but the whole system does it for you. So really just go to that link and answer correctly as fast as you can. All right, are you ready? Here is our first question. Good luck, everyone. Correct answer was clues, not absolutes. Most of you got it. Well done. Here's the leaderboard. Guest 16 is the current front runner, the perfect score of 1,000. Uh, but anybody's game at this point, here's question number two. Time's up, correct answer here. More curious, less certain, as we discussed towards the top of our time together. Guess 16, still the perfect score, I'm impressed. Uh, we've got a a several more questions, so still anybody's game. Here's question number three. Time's up. Correct question. This one's a little bit tougher. We'll see how y'all did. 77%. I think I mentioned that statistic before I mentioned there was a competition. So maybe some folks didn't tune in until I said competition. All right, let's check the leaderboard. Guess 16, still the perfect score. Very impressive. Uh, but could still be anybody's game. Here's your next question. Correct answer was how humans fulfill these needs. 70% of you got it. Well done. Guess 16, no longer a perfect score, but still hanging in there with their lead. Um, here's your next question. I think we've got two or three more questions. There you go. Correct answer, listen to outsiders. Guess 16, starting to really pull away here. <laughs> um, here is your next question. Correct answer was none of the above because we talked about all those strategies. So let's check the leaderboard once again and guess 16 with the confetti. That means you are the winner. So if you are guess 16, here's what I need you to do. 
I need you to uh, take a screenshot of your first place winnings. So that's, you, you know, if you're doing it on your phone, click both sides to take a snapshot or take a picture of your desktop and email me that screenshot uh, with your physical address as well, because I'd like to ship you a hard copy of the book. And I hope you enjoy that. And I hope that served as a good recap for a lot of the information that we covered today, as well as a good uh, interactive piece since we're, again, all huddled behind our laptops. But again, if you place first, send me that email and I'll send you that book. And congrats and thanks to everyone else for, for playing. All right, so we're going to do some questions now. Um, we're going to do the questions a little bit different than perhaps what you're used to. So we're going to use the polling. So keep using that link that we've been using this whole time and submit your questions. And then whether you submit a question or you don't, um, you, anyone can vote up or down the questions that they'd like to have me answer. Um, if there's a lot of questions, this can be helpful. That way I can answer what's most pressing in the minds of the audience. So while you're thinking about your questions and putting them in the system, here's a quick recap of everything we covered today. Uh, if you remember, generations are clues. They're not absolutes. Generational needs are more similar than they are different. It's just uh, how we go about um, fulfilling those needs varies greatly across generations. I encourage you to be more curious and less certain, specifically through the lens of working and understanding each generation. But I think that's a something that we all need to be um, leaning into more these days outside of the generational conversation. And lastly, like-minded teams maintain, uh, but generationally diverse teams are the ones that innovate. So again, if we have a diverse team, specifically generationally, it's gonna help with fostering creativity and innovation. And then here are the, th uh, the three strategies we talked about. Identify the beneficiaries of the labor, try the feedback formula, and do your best to be a guide on the side. Um, so I hope that was helpful. Um, if there's any questions, again, put them in the system. Um, if you want to come off mute too or throw them in the chat, um, I'll monitor the chat as well. Uh, but don't forget, if you have any questions that you don't feel like asking in this forum, I understand that. Send me an email. I'll be happy to answer those questions uh, as well. And I know we're running uh, a little bit behind today, so... If there aren't any questions, I have a closing video and a closing thought for all of us. Um, and that all types of questions, I think that was uh, from a previous session. Um, after I closed it, I think someone inserted that. But someone said, thank you. Well, thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, maybe, maybe one question. Do you, despite your knowledge of leadership or coaching, uh, do you still uh, sometimes, um, I don't know, find a man or woman uh, while leading people or coaching people that can surprise you uh, that you did not think about the way they think, they respond, they approach different themes or topics? Uh, because it seems that you know everything that you have are revealed, all the solutions. Yes, good question. That was a nice presentation, by the way. Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, good question. I think, you know, the tricky thing about generations at times is, you know, we don't want to make, we don't want to jump to conclusions. We don't want to make assumptions, right? So I think oftentimes people can be surprised. Um, when they find that a millennial or Gen Zer doesn't know how to use some type of technology, whether that's Microsoft Excel or some other communications platform, because someone else has made the assumption that all millennials and all Gen Zers are tech savvy. <laughs> um, so sometimes these assumptions can, can get in the way. And so oftentimes we have to you know, take a step back and use, again, use generations as clues, not absolutes. Um, but also, you know, uh, be as clear as we can when we try to communicate. And if someone doesn't understand something or perhaps they have knowledge that we didn't expect them to have, you know, how can we lean into that? How can we draw that out uh, more from people? So, you know, it's important to understand the generational dynamics, but don't let them uh, be so um, kind of create a, 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 that prevailing model that holds you back or where you create too many assumptions. Oftentimes, you know, 
getting to know the individual that are on your team um, can be really helpful. So I hope that was helpful in answering your question. Someone else uh, put in here, what is your view on cross-generational mentoring? And yeah, there's been a lot of conversation around mentoring. So um, I think it's really important. Um, now more than ever, because if you remember that clip that we saw with uh, <laughs> the grandparents inviting over the grandkids and then just handing them all their technology that didn't work. <laughs> so they weren't really inviting them over to have dinner. They were inviting them over as tech support. Um, you know, that's a good example of, of where mentoring can occur, right? Because there's emerging generations that, again, have skills and knowledge that previous generations don't have. And so that creates a, a knowledge gap. And so that's a great opportunity to do some cross-generational mentoring. Um, so that would be defined as reverse mentoring, right? When you find, when, when you find someone that's more junior than you and having them mentor you uh, can be really powerful. And as a leader or, or, or someone that's more experienced, again, taking that coaching um, mindset into a mentoring relationship where you're resisting advice giving and you're just asking more questions can be, uh, can be really compelling and you can learn a lot in those scenarios. Um, so cross-generational reverse mentoring uh, can be really important. Um, but I always encourage too in that reverse mentoring to make it uh, more reciprocal to where the more junior person is also asking questions to learn something more about the individual or the industry or the team, et cetera. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's see, how to communicate with top management that focus on intergenerational cooperation is really important and should be a strategic focus as well. Yeah, yeah, this can be tricky at times, right? To communicate up um, or lead up or lead across generations if you're more junior in an organization. Um, but I think oftentimes it starts with conversations with this, right? It starts with sessions like this um, where it's saying, hey, I, I, <laughs> I learned X, Y, and Z. Um, I wonder if that's something that we could pursue or trying to take the ownership on yourself to say, hey, I think we could start a cross-generational um, mentoring program inside the organization and then taking the ownership of, of seeing what that might look like inside the organization rather than just trying to lob more work on the plate of management um, can be effective. Um, and I once did, uh, I wrote an article about um, here in the United States, there's a really popular restaurant chain called Chick-fil-A. And there was one store owner who created the milkshake that has now become the most popular item on the Chick-fil-A's menu. And how he went about creating this change and this new item, just himself, but then making it um, appeal to the entire organization, have the entire organization eventually adopt it, is really a masterclass on how you lead up essentially, or how you create change inside an organization. So um, if you're interested in that, I would just search uh, Ryan Jenkins, Chick-fil-A milkshake, I think would probably get you there. I wrote it for Inc. Magazine um, or send me an email and I'll be happy to send you that article as well. Uh, the last question I see here is, is cooperation across companies or some sort of group education a strategy that can help understand differences and provide examples? Um, I think so. Yeah, I mean, that, you know, the, the idea of listening to outsiders. So if we can uh, co cooperate or coordinate with other organizations, that creates great opportunities for, for learning, um, you know, attending conferences that are outside the industry or that you don't normally attend can also be a great way to um, learn about other things. And um, yeah, and I've, you know, I've, I've been doing this work for a long time and I've met a lot of organizations that have different strategies on how to create more generational cohesion. And one of the ways they do it is through employee resource groups. That's what we call them here in the US, but essentially they're, they're micro communities inside a larger organization where people I, uh, with the, have certain identities. So there might be a whim, women group, there might be a, an emerging generation group, there might be you know, various groups um, that have these various identities. And the, they're inclusive groups, anyone can join them, but these generational or emerging professional um, groups are really cultivated so that they can 
bring people that we wouldn't normally connect with and they can have cross-generational conversations and they can do social events and they can do volunteering outside the organization where they're creating opportunities for folks to be interacting across generations. So there's tremendous amounts of, of learning that occurs there. There's also tremendous amounts of um, uh, you know, connections, social socializing that occurs. And what's great too for organizations is sometimes they'll tap into those micro communities to say, hey, we'd like to start uh, this program or, hey, we'd like some help with the onboarding process of our new hires, our new Gen Z hires. And they might tap into these micro communities for different insights on how they might roll out some of these various programs. So um, it's a great cross-generational tactic um, there as well. All right, my friends, uh, I, I know I've gone over. You've all been very generous with your time and attention. I have a final clip for us to, to watch to really kind of take home um, everything we've discussed today. And it really um, encapsulates so much of what we had a conversation about today. So take a look and then I'll close with a final comment and we'll be all done. Proud of you, son. GE, manufacturer. Well, that's why I dug this out for you. It's your grandpappy's hammer and he would have wanted you to have it. It meant a lot to him. Yes, GE makes powerful machines, but I'll be writing the code that will allow those machines to share information with each other. I'll be changing the way the world- You can't pick it up, can you? Go ahead. I can't lift the hammer. It's okay though, you're gonna change the world. So a this is always how we've done it mindset is a slippery slope to irrelevance. I hope I have made that abundantly clear. And especially these days, that statement couldn't be more true. But what we need to do instead, we need to prioritize why over the way. We need to be married to the mission of our organizations, but we only date the approach because the approach, the way, the how we execute things is constantly changing. So take the, the video, for example, if GE, the, if the organization was uh, prioritizing the approach, the way that they have all their new hires picking up a hammer and they wouldn't be plugging into this emerging generation to help them find the new frontiers of their industry and to help them find the new frontiers, in this case, of machine to machine learning. So all that to say, in conclusion, we should not ask, nor should we want to have each generation work like previous generations. Instead, we need to be encouraging more generational diversity and tapping into each generational strengths so that we can find the new frontiers of our industries, to find the new frontiers of our, our organization, and ultimately to find the new frontiers of work. I hope that was helpful. Thank you, everyone, for your time and attention. Uh, keep in touch. Thanks again. Thank you. I'm giving you a physical Thank applause. You, Ryan. I'm pretty Thank sure you. most of our uh, participants as well. We know how to do the um, virtual one as well. So thank you so much, Ryan, for, for sharing all of your knowledge and your uh, wisdom about uh, collaboration between generations. I really like um, the, the lecture and the proactiveness um, of your um, presentation. So it's not, here's the pro problem, here's the friction, but you also go, here's how to address it, here's what you can do. Um, and you're really specific and very concrete with uh, the algorithms that you're proposing. Uh, so we love that. I think this was a great final piece of our, um, of our conference. So I can only thank you so much um, in the name of our participants and the organizers. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Thank great you. presentation.